life. Florentines were known for arguing about everything, having lively discussions, and that's what Galileo was about. And there was tremendous appeal for him, and even more status in being attached to the court of the Grand Duke. And there were friends of Galileo's who warned him that he wouldn't be as safe in his radical beliefs in Tuscany, that, that Venice had had more of a sense of independence from the Pope than Tuscany had. The Medicis were rich and cultured, but they were also beholden to Rome. With strong ties to the Vatican, the family had produced many popes and cardinals. They could not have known the difficulties their new philosopher would bring upon himself. Leaving behind his mistress and his young son, Galileo placed his daughter Virginia and her younger sister Livia in the convent of San Matteo at Arcetri outside Florence. It was not unusual in Italy at that time to put young girls in a convent for safekeeping, to make sure they remained virgins, although it was no guarantee. But because Virginia was illegitimate, her chances for marriage were more complicated than they might have been. She would have needed a large dowry and the proper husband. And Galileo was not a wealthy man. Young nuns like Virginia were expected to loosen their ties to the outside world. Even their families would be kept at a distance. To look at what happened to the father-daughter relationship once Virginia had taken her vows gives one a sense of terrible loss, almost a living death. There's a a physical barrier between them in this grill. And yet, that again overlooks the tremendous pride of the typical Italian Catholic family then, of having a priest in the family, a nun. You were putting that child in the service of God. And what could be more important? I would not say that his placing his daughters in the convent was in any sense an act of faith on his part. In fact, it was an avenue of something to do with them because, after all, uh, their mother had only been his mistress. They were illegitimate, hence presumably not marriageable. Uh, so, so what to do? Uh, he supported them but not very lavishly. Over the course of 20 years, daughter Virginia would write dozens of private letters to her father from behind the convent walls. Galileo's servants carried the letters in baskets of food or clothing. Many of Virginia's letters survive, although all of her father's responses have been lost. Her letters suggest an enduring bond between the two, despite the harsh conditions of convent life. Most illustrious Lord Father, my room is terribly cold now, and I cannot see how I will be able to stand it, sire, unless you help me by lending me one of your bed hangings, ones that you will not need to use. I am returning the rest of your collars, which I have sewn. I pray that the Lord grant you the greatest possible well-being. From San Mateo in Arcetri, your affectionate daughter. In contrast to his daughter's life, Galileo's was becoming more comfortable and secure enough to take a risk even in the doctrinaire atmosphere of Florence. Galileo adopted the view that Copernicus was right. The sun, not the earth, was the center of our planetary system. Months passed as he struggled for a way to prove it. For him, 
demonstration was the mark of science. For something to count as a scientific claim, it had to be demonstrated, it had to be conclusively shown to be the case. Anything short of that was called conjecture or opinion. While he searched for a demonstration, a letter arrived from one of his followers, Benedetto Castelli, suggesting that the planet Venus could hold the key. My dear Galileo, if Copernicus is correct and Venus revolves around the sun rather than the earth, it is clear that she would be seen not unlike the phases of the moon, sometimes as crescent and sometimes not. Pray tell me if with your wonderful telescopes you have noticed such an appearance? To the naked eye, Venus was just a point of light. But through his telescope, Galileo saw the planet as a disk. Over a period of months, Venus changed from a small disk to a larger crescent. Galileo immediately grasped that in a sun-centered system, this crescent would appear as Venus circled in an orbit between the sun and the earth. Venus must be revolving around the sun rather than the earth. With absolute necessity, I had to accept the theory of Copernicus that Venus revolves around the sun, as do all the planets, including the earth. No longer did we have to endure any argument, however feeble, from persons whose philosophy had been badly upset by this new arrangement of the universe. But the argument was just beginning, and Galileo utterly misjudged the opposition. Opportunistic priests in Florence announced from their pulpits that Galileo was spouting dangerous new ideas. A chorus of jealous academics, bruised by Galileo's arrogance, joined the clamor. Galileo counted on his Medici patrons to protect him. But that protection started to erode when the Grand Duke Cosimo's mother began to have doubts. One of Galileo's young protégés uh, was uh, teaching mathematics and astronomy, Benedetto Castelli, and he got invited to one of the intellectual brunches that Cosimo's mother, the Grand Duchess Christina, uh, w was wont to put on. And so uh, the conversation got around to these satellites of Jupiter. Galileo had named the moons of Jupiter for the Medici family, but the Grand Duchess questioned their authenticity. Are they real? Oh yes, said Castelli, even the Jesuits down in Rome have confirmed this. And then she switched the subject. She said, what about Copernicus and what about Joshua at the Battle of Gibeon when he commanded the sun and not the earth to stand still? In the book of Joshua, the Lord halts the movement of the sun, allowing the Israelites a bit more daylight to defeat their enemies. This and a half dozen other biblical passages seem to suggest that it was the sun which moved, not the earth. The Grand Duchess Christina worried that her new court philosopher was contradicting the Bible. Galileo answered Madama Christina with a letter that went far beyond astronomy. Yeah, I agreed with Madame Christina that the Holy Scripture never lies. That the decrees contained therein are absolutely true and inviolable. Now, I should have added that though the Scripture never errs, its interpreters and expounders are liable to err in many things when they base themselves always on the literal meaning of the words. Galileo was honest when he said that if the Bible seemed to say something different from what science said, then you would just misinterpret the Bible. 